Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being with us here today for the next program in our Taking Action Together series. My name is Amy McDonald, and I'm the Education Director for the Alabama Holocaust Education Center. I must say a huge thank you to Larry and Cinda Goldberg, Jeffrey and Gail Bayer, Ronnie and Donald Hess for their incredible sponsorship of this program. We have many partners who have helped us spread the word that are listed on our website. I'm very thankful for our team, Emma, Hannah, Rachel, Mike, and Lisa for helping with all the details, big and small. A few quick housekeeping items. We're gonna be saving time at the end of our presentation so our speaker can answer a few questions. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A button. Please click on that button to submit your question. This program is being recorded and we hope that you'll share it with your friends who are not able to attend today. We're happy to provide these uh, events at no cost. If you enjoy today's program, we would greatly appreciate a donation of any size that will enable us to continue providing this important content. You can visit our website to easily make a gift and we'll also put a link in the chat. Since October 7th, many of you have called us expressing angst because people are remaining silent. We know that during the Holocaust, there were many people who we wished would have stood up for what was right. We know there are extreme consequences to silence and indifference. Our speaker today is going to address this. I'm confident you're gonna walk away with some wonderful tips on how to deal with this deafening silence you may be feeling. I could not be more excited to introduce you to Cheryl Ohayon. Cheryl Silver Ohayon holds a law degree from Harvard Law School a BA in history from the State University of New York at Binghamton, and a certificate in genocide studies from Stockton University. After a long legal career, she followed her passion for Holocaust education. She began working for the International School for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in 2005, guiding the Holocaust History Museum, writing and developing online courses for educators around the world, and creating educational videos. Currently, Cheryl is Yad Vashem's Program Director for Echoes and Reflections, a program that empowers American middle and high school educators to confidently teach the Holocaust with dynamic classroom materials and professional development. I can honestly say that I have been one of those teachers that Cheryl has really helped along the way. Cheryl has represented Yad Vashem in different contexts, both in the U.S. and Israel, at seminars and international conferences, and at the United Nations. Our goal in holding these programs is to provide you with at least one thing you can take away and put into action. After hearing today's program, I'm confident you'll find at least one thing you can do. Please join me in welcoming Cheryl. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Amy, for that lovely introduction. I uh, appreciate it. And um, uh, I hope that you will walk away with tips, um, everybody in the audience. I'm not going to guarantee that, uh, but I am going to guarantee that this webinar will definitely put a spotlight on the subject that we're discussing today. So um, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get right to it. <clears throat> okay. Here we go. So again, I'm sorry. We'll start there. Here we go. Okay. So again, thank you, Amy, and thank you to the Alabama Holocaust and Education Center for having me and for doing these terrific programs. Um, the topic today, tonight for me, because it's uh, it's already eight o'clock here in Israel, is the twin dangers of silence and indifference. Um, and what I'm gonna be doing is really speaking about the Holocaust to begin with, and then showing you how the same issues are still um, very dangerous uh, today. Um, and that's where we're going. So just a really short introduction, because I am a project director, as Amy said, for Echoes and Reflections. Echoes and Reflections is a partnership of three organizations. The ADL used to be known as the Anti-Defamation League, USC Shoah Foundation, which is where all of the Spielbergs, the testimonies that he first started filming of Holocaust survivors after he did Schindler's List in 1993, where they are kept. 
um, and Yad Vashem, which is the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem. So we are a partnership and our aim is really to give you or to give middle and high school educators in the United States the confidence to teach the Holocaust because it is a dark subject and it is a, dis a heavy subject. And we wanna make sure that your teaching is effective. Um, and in order to do that, we what we like to do is, you know, we have a whole a whole pedagogical list and we have a lot of, of, we have wonderful things online and we have all kinds of resources. They're all free and they're all on our website, echoesandreflections.org. And we'll get there later. Okay, so this is how I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start because in November of 2023, um, we actually commemorated the anniversary of the Kristallnacht Pogrom, or the Night of Broken Glass. As it's sometimes known, it was actually 85 years since that fatal night of November 9th, 1938. Um, and we continue to commemorate this date. We have continued for 85 years, and the question is, why? Why should we still remember it? What is it that we're learning from this event? What can we learn that makes it so important? So I want to go through that a little bit with you because I think it's um, I think it's very sorry, I think it's very instructive in terms of what goes on today um, in the world. So the first thing I want you to do is meet Esther Eub. As I said, one of the things that Echoes and Reflections um, preaches, for lack of a better word, is uh, telling the human story. If you're going to talk about the Holocaust as just statistics, dates, um, documents, that is going to be very dry. Nobody will remember it. It's not going to penetrate for your students. And so what you always have to do, we feel, is you always have to tell your story. So I'm going to be using Esther's story throughout like this webinar. Um, and this is Esther. This is little Esther right here. She was about two at this point. She's standing in front of her family's store in Frankfurt in 1923. She was born in Germany, but her parents were from Poland. And the reason why this will become important is because right before um, the night of broken glass, right before November 9th, actually at the end of October, 1938, Polish Jews were thrown out of Germany. Polish Jews were thrown out of Germany and that pretty much included her whole family. Somehow, in the getting thrown out, they were thrown back into Poland where they had come from. They were no longer considered citizens of Germany. Somehow Esther was separated from them and that's actually what saved her life uh, because her parents um, and most of her family wound up dying in the Holocaust. So just a little bit about Esther. She was born December 5th, 1920, the youngest of five children. In the photo that you're looking at, she's 16 years old. So she was 17 when the events of Kristallnacht happened. And I don't wanna, this is what Esther looked like when she gave her testimony. She was 76 years old then, and you're gonna see her this way in this presentation. So I don't want to, um, I don't wanna take the words out of Esther's mouth. I want you to tell her, I want, I want her to tell you herself. So I'm gonna turn on one of the testimonies that we have in Echoes and Reflections, um, and you can listen to Esther in her own words. Oh, hang on. Let's try that again. I woke up one night and there was a, a lot of noise, like the breaking of glass. And I looked out, I looked through the blinds and I saw that there were people throwing uh, stones through the windows that we knew, that I knew that the P Jewish people lived there. And they were throwing stones through all the windows, bricks and all kinds of things through those windows. And I realized that they're breaking all the windows of the Jews. And that is what became the infamous Kristallnacht, crystal night. So I put on, I dressed myself warm and I ran out of the house. I was afraid, I was always afraid to stay in the house since I was deported. And uh, I ran out of the house and I ran down, I ran to the next block and there was the, some place nearby was this synagogue, Breuer synagogue spelled B-R-E-U-E-R. -E -E and that synagogue was in flames and there were, you know, young people standing there throwing stones through this, this beautiful windows. It was a gorgeous synagogue. It was, a, it was well known, beautiful. And it was up in flames and I was standing there at the corner in awe. 
the synagogue for something. We went to the synagogue even the recent Friday, the recent uh, Sabbath, and uh, now the synagogue is in flames. I couldn't get over that, but I realized very quickly that I can't push my luck and I kept on running. I thought this was just taking place in our street and and I just kept on running and running at any place just to get away from this chaos. I, And then I realized that uh, they were still throwing bricks in many other windows. And and I went to the to this main street where we had the store and all the and and all the windows were broken and they had Jude written in big letters, Jude. And I went and I ran back again. I didn't know where to run. I always thought that there was just there must be a place where they didn't throw this. But wherever I ran there was they were throwing bricks and I decided to I had a little money from the things I thought I decided to run to the railway station because my sister was my second sister, Mary, was still in Munich. And I thought I'll go to Munich because this way I'll I'll go away from here. And that's what I did. And I got to the railway station and I got to a train and I went the train took me to Munich and I thought, oh I I'm glad I'm getting away from that chaos. But when I got to Munich, the same thing was happening there. So if you were a group of teenagers in my classroom, the first thing that I would ask you really is, what words do you hear Esther repeating? And I will, since we're not together in a classroom, I will just fill them in for you. You hear her saying, run, running, more running. You hear her saying bricks a lot and windows and fire and burning. And this gives you a definite impression of what was going on that night in Germany. But I want to show you some pictures to make it even clearer for you what this pogrom looked like. And you've heard the word pogrom also lately. Um, a pogrom is basically a uh, an, an act of, a mass act of violence, usually against Jews. Um, the word comes from East, from East Europe. Um, and what did the pogrom actually look like? So these are just some synagogues um, that were burning or were or had burned all over Germany and Austria and also in parts of Czechoslovakia. You can see the massive destruction. You can see the flames. You can see what these places that were once very grand places looked like. And this is destruction of property because Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass, was given its name by all this shimmering glass that was left on the sidewalks. Um, but you can see how intimate this was. These are photographs that were found relatively recently in a photo album in Germany um, and published. So you can see how intimate this was. These are, you know, Nazis coming into people's homes, coming into synagogues with jerry cans of gasoline and setting, or just torching the place, just setting it on fire. And again, here are some of the storefronts and the broken glass that was all over the sidewalks. So Kinder, the, sorry, um, Kristallnacht, the Night of Broken Glass is actually one of those lovely, lovely sounding names um, that is a euphemism for something that's much darker because as a result of the Kristallnacht pogrom, there were about 30,000 Jews who were arrested and sent to concentration camps for no reason except that they were Jewish. About 1,400 synagogues were burned. And imagine in the United States, that would be like all of the churches or all of the mosques or all of the places of worship being burned down in the space of one night. That's horrific. Um, about 7,100 stores were demolished. At least 91 Jews were murdered that night sometimes in their beds, sometimes taken out and shot. But of the um, Jews who were sent to concentration camps, up to 2,500 of them are going to die afterwards. Most of them will be in the camps um, from, from terrible, terrible treatment, from punishment, um, from all kinds of things like that. So these are uh, very sad numbers, very uh, horrible statistics. And those are one of the reasons that the Kristallnacht program is considered to be a turning point in the events that led to the Holocaust. Because this is kind of, 
we take this as a sign of what set Germany down this very dark path from which there was really no, no return. Um, but why is it really considered a turning point? It was sponsored by the state. So we know that the government of Germany was behind it, even though they tried to pretend that it was a spontaneous demonstration by regular citizens. And it was a very dangerous escalation of outright violence and destruction, much more than had happened until then, even though Hitler had been in power since 1933. Hitler really But there's another reason why it's seen as a turning point. Two other reasons, actually. Because the entire world and its leaders were passive and silent, despite extensive news coverage. Remember that we're now in 1938. Multiple, multiple newspapers that published all over the world were still in Germany. They had not... At a certain point later, they will be kicked out. The New York Times was there and the Post and the, the Washington Post and the British papers and the French papers. And there were there were really huge amounts of press that were in Germany covering things, again, until they are kicked out later. And so they covered this event. Um, but the world and its leaders remained passive and silent. What do I mean when I say that? The only world leader who actually who actually came out and condemned what happened on Kristallnacht was President Roosevelt of the United States. But he didn't do it right away. He waited a good five days at least before he said something to condemn the violence of Kristallnacht. And it wasn't only, I mean, Britain and France and the other allies said absolutely nothing. But it wasn't only the world and its leaders. I'm going to make it a little bit more intimate for me. The German people themselves remained passive and silent. And so you already see the theme coming in here. What is this, what is this passive passivity and silence? Where did it come from? And and how? How could the German people remain passive and silent when their friends and neighbors were suffering? I mean, these were people, the Jews were integrated into German society, mostly in larger cities, but they were integrated. Um, of course, less than 1% of the German population was Jewish. So there were a lot of people who had never met Jews, which is also a problem. But of those who did know Jews, who had neighbors who were Jews, who had friends who were Jews, how could they remain passive and silent? And so that's a question that we really need to take a look at. It's important because in figuring out how you give voice to people. And we have to understand how their voices are taken away. So going back into Nazi Germany, starting from 1933, when, when the Nazis um, move into the government, they are actually creating this climate of anti-Semitism against the Jews. Part of it comes in the form of propaganda. And this is, of course, um, Adolf Hitler's book called Mein Kampf, which is, means my struggle. And one of the most famous sentences in this book, the personification of the devil as the symbol of all evil assumes the living shape of the Jew. When you think about anti-Semitic anti tropes or anti-Semitic feeling, anti-Semitic hatred as opposed to other hatreds in the world, racism, prejudice, most, actually, I'm going to say all, in no other in no other, um, no other object of racism or prejudice has this metaphysical aspect to it. The devil as the symbol of all evil. We don't say, for instance, that LGD, LGBTQ people are evil. I mean, there are maybe are someone, some people who think that way, but it's not what, what is uh, pointed to, okay? I'm just using it as, as an example. I'm sorry if, if I'm not being politically correct here, but just as an example. This personification of the devil as a symbol of all evil, this metaphysical aspect of anti-Semitism comes really from way, way back from early Christianity, where with this accusation that the Jews were the ones who killed Jesus Christ. And that's where it starts from. Um, and so you can see why this metaphysical element is kept um, and is going to be very troublesome, in fact. Um, education in Nazi Germany also is very problematic because, for instance, this is a book cover called The Poisonous Mushroom. Um, and sorry if you're hearing my dog, 
Uh, the, the Poisonous Mushroom is basically a book that to try and teach German children, how do you identify Jews? How do you identify good Jews from evil Jews? Jews are like poisonous mushrooms. You can't tell them apart. They grow up after the rain. They're every place. And you can't tell a poisonous one from a not poisonous one. So this is to, to provide an education to children. And here you can see children of school age reading that book together. And it has all kinds of messages in it, like this one. This is also a page from The Poisonous Mushroom where these naive, innocent German children are being lured by this anti-Semitic, uh, sinister looking man with candy, right? So you get this feeling that the Jews are perverse. The Jews are maybe sex offenders. The Jews are, again, evil. They're luring these children. And, and you can see the stereotypes that are at work here. Um, another, uh, another thing that was taught in school, um, and this also comes from the poisonous mushroom, how do you identify a Jew by the, the shape of their nose? Now, that's a, a uh, drawing from the book, but this is a real life version of that very lesson that's being taught. So if we listen to Esther's testimony, again, taking it back to Esther, taking it back to the human story, you'll be able to hear what was changing as early as 1933 with all of this propaganda that is being fed to the German public. In 1933, as, as soon as he came on power, things had gotten bad because there was, I used to have friends Christian friends, we used to play, we never knew a difference between, we knew a difference in so far that we were Jewish, there were Christians, but I remember very well that came, uh, came Christmas, they would invite me, my friend would invite me to come to her house and she would show me the Christmas tree and came Hanukkah, we, she would come to our house and we would show her the, uh, the Hanukkah lamp and we would exchange little presents and uh, as soon as Hitler came on power, you could feel that uh, I could feel that they didn't want to play with me anymore. And that was very hard for a child. I remember I took that very serious. I couldn't even understand in the beginning uh, why my friends avoided me until my parents told me, well, Hitler is on power and they probably don't want their parents, probably don't want their children to play with Jewish children. So one thing after the other happened. Uh... So you hear from Esther the buildup and how she felt, because we always have to come back to the story of the victim. We always have to, that's the way we create empathy for the people who went through the Holocaust and for the people who are victimized and demonized and dehumanized. And so you hear Esther saying that even when she was a little girl, this really troubled her. Well, let's get into a little, a little bit more because it's not just the Christmas tree or the Hanukkah lamp or I won't play with you anymore. This is pro propaganda and messages that are being fed, spoon fed, if you will, forced down the throats of the German public. So let's take a look at that. Um, this is a coloring book about the Hitler Youth. And we know that the Hitler Youth was an organization uh, where... 18 year old were about to join it, basically. Um, and this organization spread this ideology of hatred and violence um, against Jews. And we cover this in Echoes and Reflections. By 1936, membership was compulsory. By the time World War II began in 1939, over 7 million young people, over 82%, were members because they had to be. Um, and what's happening in Hitler youth meetings is that they are exposed, these, these young people are exposed to propaganda, they are taught to hate Jews, regard them as their enemies, and this is carried out by propaganda, by slogans, by speeches, by rallies, you name it. Um, I want to take you to 1933. This is the boycott of you Jewish businesses, and what you see here is a picture of from April 1st, 1933, with two SA men, you can only see the one on the left, who are standing in front of a Jewish store, and they're holding up a sign that says, the Juden sind unser Unglück, which means the Jews are our misfortune or the Jews are our curse. And this was a slogan that was found everywhere. And it was repeated and repeated and repeated. And remember what Goebbels 
and Hitler both believed about repetition. You repeat something and you repeat something and you repeat something until it's believed. You're the big lie theory. You just continuously repeat it and you make it simple because it needs to be projected to the to the most simple people. So keep it simple and constantly repeat it. You can see it here on a bumper sticker. You can see it here in a children's book and on uh, in 1935 at two different places of business. Okay, so this is going to be repeated and repeated. And now I wanna take you to Der Sturmer, which was basically a weekly uh, magazine newspaper that was published um, by, by uh, Julius Streicher, who was actually tried at Nuremberg uh, and sentenced to death after the war. Um, even though all he did was publish a newspaper, all he did was publish a newspaper. Uh, basically, he was guilty of murder because um, the newspaper was involved such a high level of propaganda. It was akin to social media of that era. And basically, if you look at the statistics, the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg after the war found that there were about 700,000 copies per week, um, 2 million issues for Nazi party rallies. And the way people got this newspaper was not by having it delivered. Um, it, was, it was actually, and of course, look at the tagline on every single issue of this, of this weekly. It says, Die Juden sind unser Unglück. And this is how people saw it. They read it. There's that tagline again. It was, it was, um, it, it was, sorry, I'm looking for a word. It was put up on, on billboards, basically, in the street. Um, and so anyone who wanted to read it could come and read it. And the fact that you see all of these people who are gathered around this board uh, where this newspaper is being shown makes you think, that everyone must agree with it. You see everybody reading it. So you get curious and you go and read it. And that's also another way that this message is transmitted, that everyone is against the Jews. Here's another issue of Der Sturmer. You can see the goal of the Jews is to devour the entire world. A wonderful picture, right? Pretty clear what the picture means. And again, the tagline. Um, excuse me, another issue. Jewish murder plan against Gentile humanity revealed this is basically the blood libel issue, um, the special issue, which shows, and if you take a look at that picture, you can see those are Christian babies and their blood is dripping into this saucer that is being held by the Jews who are collecting the blood. You can also see the, the bloody knife. I'm sorry. And the crosses in the background as though they have just come from a cemetery. The blood libel is a myth that's been around for a very long time, since the 1300s, even actually earlier earlier than that, because the first reported blood libel was in 1144 in Norwich, England. And it is the myth that says that Jews kill Christian children to use their blood in Jewish rituals, like baking matzah on Passover, like drinking wine on Friday nights. Of course, there is nothing to it. Jews are not permitted to eat or drink blood uh, because it is considered to be part of the soul of a, of a, not just a human being, but also of an animal. So kosher meat is meat that does not contain any of that blood. But it doesn't really matter because, again, when you tell a lie and you tell it often enough, people will believe it. So again, here are issues of Der Sturmer. Uh, being given out. You can see this one. Who is the enemy? The Jew wants war. The peoples do not. The people bleed and the Jews are victorious. So again, this is another kind of blood libel type of propaganda. And there is the tagline, as you see. In addition to all of the propaganda, and I'll do this pretty quickly, you have the discriminatory legislation, the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, made sure that Jews were no longer citizens. Um, here's a, the uh, Albany Evening News, Jews stripped of German citizenship, the Reich places the Jews back in the Middle Ages. Uh, public humiliation, Jews are not allowed to have relations with non-Jews. If they do, they can be humiliated in the streets. So you understand, this is a Jewish man who had sexual relations with a German woman, and they are both uh, wearing signs. His says something like, I'm a pig, 
I sleep with Aryan women and and or hers says that um you get the point. They're being marginalized. They are they are experiencing a social death. There were park benches that were not not for Jews, marked specifically. So slowly but surely they're being pushed out of German society. August 17th, 1938, they are forced to have the J stamped on their race, race pass, which is basically a passport. And they are also forced to add the middle names Israel for a man and Sarah for a woman. The problem here is that no one is speaking up. Or very few people. Books were burned on um, in May of 1933. No intellectuals said, you can't do this. No professors protested when their Jewish colleagues were fired, basically because they got the jobs, or when the number of Jewish students was reduced. No church authorities spoke up when, because of their Jewish religion, citizenship was taken away from the Jews. And no German businessman protested when Jewish businesses were boycotted. So all throughout German society, no one spoke up. And that's the problem. You see where I'm going. Within Germany, almost no one spoke up for the Jews and Hitler understood he could count on silence and indifference. This is a great quote from Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel, of course, is the um, Nobel Prize winning author of Night and also a lot of other books. He's a survivor of the Auschwitz death camp, concentration camp. And this is what Elie Wiesel says. What is indifference? Indifference can be tempting, more than that, seductive. It is so much easier to look away from victims. It is so much easier to avoid such rude interruptions to our work, our dreams, our hopes. It is, after all, awkward, troublesome to be involved in another person's pain and despair. Yet for the person who is indifferent, his or her neighbor are of no consequence. And therefore, their lives are meaningless. Their hidden or even visible anguish is of no interest. Indifference reduces the other to an abstraction. And he goes on. In a way, to be indifferent to that suffering is what makes the human being inhuman. Even hatred at times may elicit a response. You fight it. You denounce it. You disarm it. Indifference elicits no response. Indifference is not a beginning, it is an end, and therefore it benefits the aggressor, never his victim, whose pain is magnified when he or she feels forgotten. Indifference then is not only a sin, it is a punishment. And this is one of the most important lessons of this outgoing century's wide ranging experiments in good and evil. Okay, so this is Elie Wiesel, and you see how he feels about indifference. He's, he has said the opposite of of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of, and he he thinks that indifference is the way for the Holocaust. Um, and I will say that indifference paired with silence is a lethal combination, which you're gonna see. This is Kurt Messerschmidt. Let me introduce you to Kurt. Kurt was born in Germany in 1915. And I will just tell you that in Echoes and Reflections, we have biographical information about all of these people because we wouldn't want you to just introduce them as, this is Kurt, he was a victim of the Holocaust. We want you to know a little bit about his life before, a little bit about his life during, a little bit about his life after. So I will tell you very quickly, he was born in Germany in 1915. He was very intelligent. Um, he was, actually his uh, teachers and classmates considered him to be a, a special sort of Jew, an outstanding sort of Jew, unlike all those other Jews. And when Kristallnacht came around in 1938, Kurt was a sports teacher. He had already been, he was not allowed to work um, in any other place but a Jewish school because he had already been, those laws had already been passed preventing Jews from working in schools uh, that were German schools. So he was working in a Jewish school, which worked out fine for Kurt because that's actually how he met his wife. Uh, and they married and... Um, were sent to different camps and actually managed to find each other after the war, which also worked out very nicely for Kurt. I will say that Kurt um, got, he was a survivor of Auschwitz and he wound up coming to the United States uh, after a stint in Germany as a cantor. Kurt had a beautiful singing voice. Um, and he was in, was in Germany as he stayed in Germany after the war as a cantor. And um, he, 
later made his way to Maine in the United States, where he lived until the age of 103. And he passed away only five years ago. Kurt is going to tell you about his experience of Kristallnacht, and he has a definite message. In 1938, One of those dates which I can never forget, and we all don't forget it. When November 10th every year comes around, I'm the one who remembers this day vividly. While even my non American uh, friends, American Jewish friends, don't remember it unless they read finally about it. This was the so called Crystal Night. That night, uh, I listened to the radio forbidden, BBC, uh, the night before, and read all about what had happened in Paris, and uh, that measurements would be taken to avenge the death of this Herrn von Rath, killed by a Jewish boy. I uh, listened to the radio in a friend's house and I rushed home, woke up the next morning. My transportation to school was about seven miles, was by bicycle. I was fortunate at that point, I still was allowed to have a bicycle. All these things were taken away later. I, I went through all these things, uh, lost everything. Uh, but on bicycle, I went through seven miles of glass splinters. It's amazing that the uh, bicycle lasted. My dear colleague, Uri Sonnenfeld, who was the main sports coach, was still there, and we sat there for a moment, deciding what to do. But there was no question. We took our bicycles and made a tour of the whole city of Berlin. We came to Friedrichstraße, it's a well-known term now. There was a little, very tiny cigar stop, shop, cigar shop. The owner was a very, very old man, tiny old gentleman. But there were people standing around, 40, 50 people, and two of the Sturmabteilung, the SA, not SS, SS are the one in, in the black uniforms, and the um, and these are the brown, excuse me, the brown shirts. Uh, of course, with all their equipment, and they forced this very old gentleman to pick up the tiny glass splitters one by one. And they forced this man to do this. And they all were standing there and watching. We didn't know what to think, but the only thing we could think of, the only thing we could think of was help. So we put our bicycles down. Rudy and I, we went in front of that group that was surrounding this old gentleman, went down on our knees, and started picking up glass splitters one by one to help this man. Briefly, I looked at the two guys. They didn't blink. They didn't move. Why did they not move? I asked myself. Are they afraid that the people might agree with us or not? I have never figured out what it was, but I'm sure in this particular situation that some of the people standing there disapproved of what the Nazis did, but their disapproval was only silence, and silence is what did the harm. This is one of my favorite testimonies from Echoes because first of all, it's so descriptive that you can almost hear the bicycles crunching over the glass. But aside from that, Kurt really does deliver this message 
that silence is what did the harm. So I'm going to sum this up. The events of November 9th, 1938, Kristalna, came after a slow and steady buildup. Most people just watched it happen. And very few had the courage to protest. As Kurt says, their disapproval was only silence. And silence is what did the harm. So over this background of propaganda and the laws that were discriminating against the Jews and the mar marginalization of G the Jews and harassment and social death and peer pressure, right? You have this growing hatred or indifference, which is worse than hatred, as Elie Wiesel tells us, which leads to this unwillingness to stand up for the targeted group, which results in silence, which results in violence. And this is the story of the Kristallnacht pogrom. And this is also the story of the Holocaust, because from that time, the Nazis understood that so few people would stand up and do something about this and say, stop, what you're doing is awful. It's horrible. You can't do this to people. So few people were going to do that, that they felt that they could just go ahead with their plans. And here comes the, the present. OK, this is where we relate it to the present. Because this still continues today. When people in institutions are silent and indifferent and fail to take a stand against anti Semitism, violence can result. What am I talking about? Very quickly, Charlottesville, you remember 2017, Jews will not replace us. Uh, and the huge spike in anti Semitic incidents after the Charlottesville rally. The Tree of Life shooting in 2018, where 11 Jews were killed. This is a class picture from Baraboo, Wisconsin in November of 2018, where all these students are giving the Hitler salute, but they're not punished. Why aren't they, why aren't they punished? Because people believe they're just fooling around, free speech, all kinds of things like that. This is Orange County in California in March of 2019, where you can see the swastika, um, which is uh, portrayed there in beer cups, um, by these kids who are playing beer pong. And this high school junior says, I believe every student in the photo was normalized to joking about the Jewish culture, okay? So because of silence, because nobody says a word. Then you have the shooting in Poway, California in 2019. This is a shooting in Jersey City in 2019 where three are killed. The knife attack, machetes in Muncie, New York in 2019, in Brooklyn, at incident after incident after incident, you just have to live with it, okay? Acquiescence, right? Then you've got the Kanye West controversy. This is a big jump to 2022. I'm going DEF CON on Jewish people. Uh, and his whole, you know, all of his social media posts that talked about the Jews controlling Hollywood and the Jews controlling business and the Jews who were greedy, 50 million people following him on social media. Here's a, a freeway in Los Angeles. Kanye is right about the Jews. Honk if you know it. Um, the anti-Semitic campaign continues. And then you get to Kyrie Irving in um, the Brooklyn Nets, where he tweets or posts a link to an anti-Semitic film that denies the Holocaust ever happened. In 2022, there was a 36% increase over the anti-Semitic incidents in 21, the highest number on record since the ADL began tracking. But that was before the events of October 7th, 2023. And what happens on October 7th, 2023, you know, Hamas attacked Israel. Um, this is, I, I mean, these photographs are just awful and I have trouble looking at them, especially this one, because these, these three people, Shiri Bibas and her sons, Ariel, who was four at the time, and Kfir, who was nine months old at the time, are still either being held hostage in Gaza or have already been killed. So the single greatest atrocity since the Holocaust, um, Israel was very, was traumatized by it. And just some statistics for you about the war crimes that were committed by Hamas, 1,200 who were slaughtered, 5,000 injured, 240 kidnapped, including 32 children, most of whom have been released, but not all. 10,000 rockets launched into Israel, and all of these murders and atrocities were filmed. This is personal to me because at Yad Vashem, we had two people who worked with us who were taken hostage into Gaza. Liat Atsili, who is the woman in the, in the picture on the left, and also Alex Danzig, who was a teacher of mine. So I knew Alex pretty well. Liat 
has been released. Alex is still being held. He's 75 years old. He has a heart condition. Okay. Why are all of you silent? Um, this was an article that was published in Tablet Magazine a couple of days after, um, after this horrible Hamas atrocity. And I'll just read a little piece of it for you. Um, because it's basically about the people who watch the news and read and they understand they're appalled, but they stay silent because as horrible as the videos of blood-soaked rape victims make them feel in the spaces they inhabit, Israel is bad and they'd rather avoid the annoyance of speaking up. So they say nothing in public. Um, and the article goes on to say, but we need you because social media has now become a field of war, not just metaphorically, but literally. Um, you can support Palestinian statehood. You can have any opinion you want about the regional politics of the Middle East and still believe that jihadist terrorists should be condemned. And that's the only way to break this cycle of demonization and intimidation into silence. So you'll see here a lot of, a lot of headlines about silence. Silence is damning. This is the Israeli Writers Guild, which said to the American Writers Guild, it's a shame that a professional writer's guild can't find the words to condemn an act of terrorism. A shame that they decide to withhold world, words to keep utterly silent and to not take a stand. This is Bono who actually did take a stand, but he was one of the rare celebrities who did that. Why? Millions of people are appalled by the massacre, but they don't take a stand. And this of course is the whole issue of sexual violence and Israeli women and all of the rapes and the fact that it took the UN two months, two months to pay attention to what we already knew and what reports were coming out of that basically rape had been systematically used by Hamas as a weapon of war. Um, and this is from a British uh, opinion. We need to call out the trends behind this conspicuous denial of crimes against women and girls in Israel. And Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, when I saw the list of women's rights organizations who have said nothing, I nearly choked. Then the New York Times, this was all at, at the UN, they actually heard there was a, a, a short um, presentation at the UN about what was going on um, that was, uh, it was brought together by Sheryl Sandberg and also Israel's representative to the United Nations. And then a few days later, the New York Times published their very in-depth essay about how Hamas weaponized sexual violence. And the details are absolutely gruesome. But the bottom line is silence. Evil does not know boundaries. It does not care what language you speak or skin color you have or how much money or titles you possess. Evil destroys everything in its path and silence enables it. Case in point, the United Nations General Assembly has still failed to adopt a resolution that condemns the October 7th terrorist attacks. And again, as I as you saw in an earlier slide, it doesn't matter what you think of the Palestinian conflict. How can you not condemn a terrorist attack that brutally massacres 1,200 people, takes 240 civilians, innocent civilians, kidnaps them, um, wounds, just completely brutalizes, and we know what condition a lot of the bodies were found in. Burned, beheaded. Of course, this is the silence of Columbia, Barnard College, and you'll see also Harvard. Um, and what does this empower people to do, this silence? It empowers people to harass Jewish students, to take things into their own hands, to shout, about Intifada and about from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, which is really a call for the eradication of the state of Israel. So it's not a surprise that more than half of Jewish students feel scared on US college campuses. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna wrap up pretty quickly. This is the uh, incident where Jewish students in Cooper Union in New York locked themselves in a library because they were so scared. This is on the campus of Harvard where Jewish students were harassed. And this is a threat Recently, if you look at this article, it's January 19th. So that's a couple of, just a few days ago. Um, no business as usual at MIT until the Jewish state is eradicated. And let's see what MIT's president will do. 
because it's really questionable um, whether she will take any action. So there's this world of fear for Europe's Jews, um, a thousand percent surge in anti-Semitic context content on X. Why can't Americans condemn anti-Semitism? One case of a man who was killed at a pro-Palestinian video. And here we wrap things up and I'm going to conclude. As Elie Wiesel said, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. So when good people remain silent, what happens is silent. What happens is an unprecedented rise in anti-Semitic incidents, more than 337%, um, which has been relentless. And as Jonathan Greenblatt says of the ADL, officials and college leaders must turn down the temperature and take clear action to show this behavior is unacceptable. Um, if you are neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. That's Desmond Tutu. And as Hillary Clinton said, it isn't enough to look deep into our own hearts and say we find them free of hatred. We have to do more. Every time we let a religious or racial slur go unchallenged or, or an indignity go unanswered, we are making a choice to be indifferent, a choice to constrict the circle of human dignity, a choice, I believe, to ignore history at our children's peril, because silence protects the perpetrator and not the victim. And here's Elie Wiesel again, to remain silent and indifferent is the greatest sin of all, because what does it lead to right now? Now what's happening is that there's denial of the October 7th massacre, gaining pace online. This article is from two days ago in the Washington Post, growing October 7th truther groups say that Hamas massacre was a false flag. In other words, not only are they denying all of the GoPro footage that was filmed by the Hamas terrorists, but these people are also starting to deny the Holocaust. Here's an anti-Israel group posts, then deletes Holocaust denial. And this is from January 22nd, yesterday. So why should we care so much about growing anti-Semitism? Because anti-Semitism is the proverbial canary in a coal mine. It's a symptom it's the early warning sign of the disease of intolerance throughout an entire culture. It threatens democracy because it's basically a conspiracy theory. And what, while it may start with the Jews, it never ends with the Jews. Um, it, there's a deadly interplay that's dangerously underestimated. Um, here we have Martin Niemöller, which you know if you are familiar with Holocaust education, Sometimes this poem is called First They Came. And he says, in Germany, they came for the communists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist, et cetera, et cetera. Then they came for me. And by that time, there was no one left to speak for me. So just as the Holocaust couldn't have happened without the silence and indifference of the bystanders, anti-Semitism today is encouraged by the silence and the difference of society. and. If I have to say one thing, it is that we have to push back against this politicization of Jewish murder by standing up when we know that something is wrong. We have to find the courage to take a side at a moment when history is watching because we already know and we've already seen what happens when they come for the Jews and people say nothing. And I leave you again with Kurt Messerschmidt. Their disapproval was only silence and silence is what did the harm. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna get rid of this. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing now so that I can see you, you can see me. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them. I know we only have seven minutes left, but <laughs> we'll do what we can. Okay, thank you so much, Cheryl. I was, uh, I'm looking, I've been keeping up with a couple of the questions. We might have time for one quick question, maybe two. Um, so you you mentioned one question is you know you mentioned about silence being dangerous. I mean, how do you or how can you explain to people you know that that silence when all they want to do is step back? How do you explain to people the concept that their silence is dangerous? I think I think Amy, I think what you do is you you give them. An example like Kristallnacht, which is why I started the presentation with Kristallnacht, because it's very easy to see the cause and effect. It's very easy to see that 
from 1933 till 1938, the fact that Germany was silent, the fact that no one spoke up for the Jews basically led to this pogrom. And after that pogrom, again, it was a road that Germany was going down. There was no there was no return from that from that. It was a point of no return. And once you're once you're there, you know, that's it. Um, then all hell breaks loose. So uh, it was really it's really considered to be a milestone in the history of the Holocaust. Um, the Holocaust couldn't have happened if people had spoken up, if people had said something. And maybe what you do also is you give them you give them demonst a demonstration of what happened when people did say say something. For instance, the Rosenstrasse demonstrations where the um, German Aryan women who were married to Jewish men who were picked up and about to be sent to camps actually demonstrated in the streets of Berlin and the Nazis came and they pointed machine guns at them and these women stood their ground and they refused to let these to let their husbands be taken away. And after a couple of days, the Nazis had to give in because they didn't want to create a spectacle because this this was supposed to be a lot quieter. It's a very interesting incident. And you can read more about it. Rosenstrasse. That's the name of the street where they were being held. Right. I think that's a great example. There were a couple of uh, maybe one or two other questions, but you are you answered them right as we were finishing. And we really try to be careful to end right at right at one o'clock. So unless there are any other questions, and I'm checking. Okay. Well, Cheryl, thank you so much. I mean, this was, wow. Um, I want to talk about our next program that's coming up. It's called Interfaith Friendships, Building Bridges During Hard Times, and it'll feature John Archibald. He's moderating a conversation between a Jewish woman, Leah Nelson, and a Muslim man, Ali Masood, who will talk about how they are different yet remain good friends. It'll take place on February 7th at noon central, and we invite you to join us. We'll be continuing to add more and more programs that we hope you will find of interest. Be sure to check your email participants because you're gonna be receiving a follow-up email with a survey and a link to the recording of this program. And we get our best traction by word of mouth and would greatly appreciate you forwarding this uh, recording and schedule of programs, especially to people who weren't able to make it today. And if you think this program was valuable, your donations will help us continue this important education. Cheryl, thank you so much again. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you for your, your words of wisdom. We look forward to seeing everybody again soon. And thank you for being with us here today.